Okay, we're back here at AWS On the Ground. Dave Vellante with Rob Stretchy. We've been going deep dives all day here in lovely Seattle. Tracy Doherty is here as the general manager of QuickSight at AWS. Tracy, good to see you. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's good to be here as well. So can you describe which, you know, the cues and where you're focused, uh, QuickSight, Q for QuickSight, QuickSight for Q? Yeah, yeah. Help us understand that. Yeah, so so the way I would say it is QuickSight as a whole is our, our BI, our business intelligent offering. Um, so think of it as building dashboards, reports, sharing data from from databases and data where this the world. Right? Yeah, all the visualization to to really make data consumable by the the average business user that doesn't know behind the scenes the technical part of it. The Q to your question, there's a Q in QuickSight that enables um, various aspects of the product to be better. So think of it as the assistant within the product for the given persona. So if you're the person building dashboards or reports, Q helps you do that. It, it'll build a visit uh, through natural language. You can ask a question and it'll build a visualization. It'll wire it to the right data and put it on the dashboard and, and help you produce that or edit or change it. You could also do it for uh, complex calculations, which that person would do. If you switched over the persona to the business user, the person who consumes it, it's very much of, hey, how do I ask questions of my data? That I have no idea how it's stored, what it is, but I want to ask a question and get an answer that augments my dashboard or report. You do that. Or we have a third thing about creating a story where you can actually think of it as writing a, a presentation or a narrative from your data that's in a database or a data warehouse. And that's for the end user to do that. So, so we have even in the same product, we have different flavors. A very wide spectrum of capabilities. So, you know, from yeah. a hardcore, you know, analytics person, they can dig in. You've got sort of what I would call essentially a low code through natural language processing capability. And for the business user who doesn't want to know any of that stuff, just tell a story with data. That's right. Yeah. And, and it differs from the other cues because there's Q for developer and Q for business and Q for quick site that, and those are really more like focused agents for each of those personas, right? That's right. The, 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 now, there is some cross, so I think the cue for developer, it, it, like its name suggests, is very much for a particular type of persona that, that, that helps them with that. The cue for business ultimately has some crossover, and you may, you may as a business user, experience both. You may have QuickSight, and you use the cue in it. You may also use the cue in cue business. And we, you know, going forward, we'll, we'll try to blend the lines between these things to make it most valuable for that end user of what they're trying to do. And, and when you look at you know, for uh, QuickSight, a again, when you said, again, it's, it's the business intelligence uh, using yeah. artificial intelligence, you know, all the intelligence. Yeah. And when I look at that, the different personas that are involved in creating dashboards, creating end of, you know, end of quarter, end of year types of reporting and things of that nature. It, it's pretty complex. You have a lot of data engineering in there. You have some maybe platform engineering. How does Q and QuickSight really simplify that for customers? Yeah, it, it's, it, it does it in today in really two primary, primary ways of it really does wire together the intent of what the person wants to build with the data. So if you think about it today, and the product's actually pretty amazingly simple to use already to create a dashboard and a report, but you have to know what data you want to connect to, what chart type you want, where do you want to place it. There's a lot of things you still have to, from a design perspective, because it's individual, but that part of just saying, hey, what was, uh, show me uh, monthly sales and then have a visualization pop and have it wired to the right thing in the database or the data warehouse and then pop up and, and exist is a huge time saver. So say you do that for 10 different visuals, you have it on your, on your dashboard, you, you could do this literally in minutes. Now maybe you want to edit all of them. You want to add some filter to all of them where you ask the question and, and so we give you the opportunity to go back and tweak those things as, as well. And you can do it through either the natural language or you could do it standalone the way you've always done it. So I think of it very much of, of one, helping the person that does this job do it faster or more efficient and also opening the doors up to somebody who may be less skilled at it to get to, get to the end point much faster. And that's more on the, on the, on the technical side. Um, you'd also add the other question on the business user, which is really about 90% of the users that consume this stuff. And... The BI space has always had this fallacy, in my opinion, where they say self-service. 
And my running joke is self-service meant somebody on the tech side said, well, here's something I don't want to do, so I'm going to just hand it to end users so they can do it, which is not self-service. The trick to self-service is getting people to do the thing they wanted to do. And we spun the, I guess you would say, change the wheels on it when, when we found end users really looked at a dashboard and report, which usually causes them to have more questions. In the world today, that was, okay, now i got to go talk to the data engineer to go find the answer to this question because it's not on my dashboard. We wanted the solution to be, no, I can ask the question myself and get back this multi-visual response that, that gives me an answer that I can believe in and trust in, and then I can pin and save the, the answers so that I can use it later. And I love about augmenting that. I, I mean, I love that vision of that, that simplicity, but if I zoom out and think about just the complexity of the data pipeline, yeah. I've got to ingest it, I've got to transform it, I've got my data quality engineer, I got to, then I have to bring in the metadata, I have to bring in governance. I mean, you know this yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, but it looks, feels like Gen AI is simplifying your world. And hopefully all that other complexity in that data pipeline, I feel like the data pipeline that we know and not always love yeah. is going to transform here in the next, I don't know, three to five years. Yeah. And, and, and if, if, do you buy that premise? And what role do you see QuickSight playing in that simplification and transformation? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. I, I, do, I do buy it because what you find is 70, 75% of time gets spent by, by organizations in that part of, of arguably preparing the data. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, you'll see a lot of investments that'll help us make that better and more efficient. QuickSight has its own data prep area. We want to improve that and change that and take advantage of, of that as we go through it. The other thing you'll find is preparing data for natural language is slightly different than preparing it for dashboards and reports. You, because because a fun fact for you, the average same question is asked about seven different ways by a human. And so you have to interpret that to get to the same answer. And so how do you, how do you prepare the data so that it can, they can give you ultimately the same query for the, for the different variation of the question? So there's a lot of work that we can continue to do on, on that. I mean, LLMs have gotten so much better yeah. at understanding the question just in a couple of years. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I don't know how, maybe it's chain of thought or it's prompting itself. However it does it, it's like magic. But very clearly, we were using the example before, Tracy, of how you used to put a plus sign when you were doing a search and yeah. this plus that, you were plusing keywords. That's right. and it, I mean, think about that anymore. That's right. So, you know, Gen AI seems to be going through a much more sophisticated but similar transition yeah. That's or right. evolution. That's right. And you'll find that even on the side of the business user side, there's even more pressure because in general, it's an audience that's not very forgiving, right? If it doesn't work the first or second time, people disappear and, right. and go back to their old ways. So you, So you have to do that. We've learned a lot in some of our experience of doing this this last three years of how we let people ask questions, how we answer them back is quite a bit different than we did three years ago. You know, it's not a ask a question A and get an answer B. That's not what, it's not really how the human works, right? So, and we found users don't really know exactly the question they want and they want to be a, a more holistic answer. And then you find some of the common things that are super hard. I'll, I'll give you an example. The word quarter. Financial terms means three months. Uh, in a football game, it's 12 or 16 minutes. Both are obvious in context. Neither are ever mentioned in the database because right. they're so obvious, right? So this is one of these things where you have to really know more of the context as a whole, and the data's got to be, um, I guess you'd say massage a little bit so that you can get really, really good answers for those things. Yes. I like the word harmonize. Yes. Right. But, but, but off of the harmonization and, and the aspect of that, I, I think a lot of organizations, they look at their BI solution. It's not just all about one database and getting all the data, yep. one data lake. And the, how do you, because you're not the only, only one in town, yep. uh, um, how do you look at that integration, not only within AWS ecosystem, but with, you know, outside the ecosystem as yeah. well? Yeah. It, it, another good question. It, the, the thing is, for QuickSight, we obviously do it well with the, the AWS sources. But we, we also, our next biggest thing is with what we call on-premise sources. So you can pick your famous databases and data warehouses have been around for years, and we will connect to them and, and have a v, VPC t to enable us to bring that in. Um, and the nice thing, over time, what people do is they get those off of premise and put them in the cloud, and then it, it, then it joins together, and it's more efficient that way. But you also 
there I mentioned things in databases, data warehouses, data lakes. Um, but that's not all the data. Either. There's more data sources that are out there. And so we look at that of how do we expand it more and more. And we can do this and kind of part to your question of how are we different than, than some of the other tools that have been around is since we were built in the cloud first, we weren't built from an on-premise solution. We think quite a bit different. We scale quite a bit different. Um, our performance is quite a bit different. It, because of that, we can actually connect to more things and do it in an affordable way and scale it with, with great performance as we go along. So that's another piece that our architecture, I would always say when I first joined the team seven years ago when I was just launching, I would say this phrase that we were architecture rich and feature poor. Today, I would say we're, we're still architecture rich because you can't change that quickly, but we've really, really worked so hard on all the features and capabilities. And Gen AI is just another piece to build on that architecture and expand it. You just gave me an idea, a thought. Um, when you think about the, the BI industry is uh, it's huge, probably about 50 billion, let's call it. Uh, um, and it's been built up to to help us get through all this complexity of databases yep. and then serve it up to the, to the business. You, when you mentioned being able to go on-prem and connect to on-prem data, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, Warner Vogels talks about this massive distributed system that the cloud has become. And we always talk about the fact that a lot of these activities are asynchronous. This has, it's a historical system of, of truth, yep. analytic system of truth. And we're, we're excited about the day where you can actually have a digital representation of your business. And I can ask almost in real time a question as a business user or other about the state of the business, um, where you're integrating with the supply chain and your CRM and your financial system. Do you see that day in, in the horizon? I, I, I do. I do see that day. I, there, there's a, but there's a lot of complexities that come into it. And, and it's, not very many of the complexities are technical. It's more of who has the, the permissions to look at what. So when you take your example, there's usually a, a set of people that have permissions to one thing versus another versus another. So the challenge tends to be, how do you connect the dots on that way to, to the business user who wants to ask the question, and do they have the access to all those things or not, right? And, and that that's tends to be where more of the complexity comes in. So things like governance and lineage and all these things matter, but there's also a, um, there's also a cultural effect of company by company. What, what makes sense for them? You know, everybody says they want to get there, but it requires this next level of self understanding. Yeah. But that, that was, you know, you, something popped into my head, which, you know, not, not surprising. Yeah. Like when you, you bring up the word lineage and you bring up, and then you have AI and you have BI explainability and, you know, trust comes up a lot. How do you, how do you talk to people about how they can trust Q on QuickSight to really bring back the right answer? Because they're like, Hey, it wasn't wired together by my data engineer. I need to believe in Q yeah. on QuickSight. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things we, we do. Um, and it, one part is there is some data preparation that takes place on the back end by the engineer to go through to do some things um, to make sure that they can provide an even better tailored answer for the, the thing. Second thing is we don't let the LLMs do the math or anything like that. We do the math because it's 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 our data, so we so we get that right on that side. The third thing we do though is big on the end user of earning trust is is how we represent the answers and the questions. You know, we have a lot of things on. Are you sure this is what you meant? Do you mean this? Because what we found. In our early earnings, we would be very highly accurate on the answer, but the person interpreted, their interpretation of the question was different than our interpretation of the question. So we do more things on the experience side. I said, did you mean this? Is this what you meant? We, we try to work really hard to clarify what we're answering. And then we don't give it in a single answer. We give multiple visuals and a text-based answer so that there's enough information there that they can go, no, yeah, that that that, that makes sense. It may not be exactly what I asked, but it's it's clearly accurate information to go through and do that. And then we allow them to pin certain things that they, that they like or not like. We also say, hey, were you satisfied with the thumbs up or thumbs down? But the answer, honestly, only a small percentage of people ever plug those in. So you have to just do a good job anyways. That, that's kind of, 
I'm giving you a, a kind of a multi-pronged answer, but we have to think about these different factors to earn that trust. So staying on or coming back to the governance question, how do you integrate with governance solutions? Are they AWS IP? Is it third party? I mean, there's all kinds of governance. There's open source governance now and catalogs. And yeah. how do you integrate? Yeah, you, you, you do. Well, there's some of both, but but data zone is our, our yep. own offer that we have. And so there's integration with data zone. There's continued work that we're that we're doing on that front. So that gives you the, the both the data catalog and the and the governance pieces to go with that. Um, a lot of companies do their homegrown. They they make their their own solution and they try to wire into it. And we have some big customers that do that. Um, I think that's mainly due to they have a demand, but maybe the thing that they want to get out there isn't quite there yet. And so we're no, really no different than most other BI tools in that we're dependent upon a separate catalog and governance, but we wire into them and go from there. And so data zone, there would be um, the the metadata catalog with, with, is that the operational and the business metadata? It's, it's more the business one. We have the glue, glue catalog. Glue, it's more the technical metadata. Technical one and, and so I can data zone. Do you need? And they're and they're closely together, so but you need access to both, right? And you do, yeah, yeah, and you do. You'll connect, and we connect to both. Yeah, okay. So I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. You're going to do that connection. Yeah, there, there will be a, a data engineer on the background that'll worry about. That. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. but, but, some, but yeah, for sure, because that data is is again the t the trick is if it's in a data warehouse or or a, a database or a data lake. I mean, it's not, it's not. Um, how would I say it? It's not willy nilly data. It's serious data, right? Somebody is is managing this, making sure it's accurate. There's, to your point, there's pipelines coming in and monitoring and all that. Our job is to represent it in a way that it can be consumed by, by every user in the company if they want to. But the example you gave before was an interesting one. Is it, is a quarter a time period? You know, is it a, is it, is it money? <laughs> you know, is it, yeah. what is it? And, and so come back to that. I, again, we like the word harmonization. Are yeah. you doing that harmonization? Is AI doing that? Is there some... It, it's, it's, a, a, it's a point in time answer. In the beginning, we were doing a lot of it. Um, and we have this concept of a topic that you can create. And so you can do things like synonyms, synonyms and names and, and all that. So you could define in there, hey, quarter for this data means X and, and it means something else for Y. Um, as, as the LMs get better and science gets better, they have more knowledge and insight to go down that path. And so it evolves. The thing I will tell you though, that we found the most obvious terms tend to be the challenging ones because they're obvious in different industries, but they're not the same, you know? And so we, we found it from sporting analytics, the terms they use, some common terms similar to financial, but means completely different things. You could take manufacturing and medical care and you'd sign these similar things. So it's a, it's a really, interesting and challenging it is a big challenge because you've got it, it, when as you reach into those s systems that are either on prem or in the cloud those apps yeah. business apps etc supply chain erp those definitions yeah. that are and and they're the nice thing though is they're obvious to that industry yeah so it, it is something that somebody can massage it pretty quickly and go through that it's sometimes ob not obvious that they need to because it's such an obvious term but then you talk to folks and go, hey, is that, how do you define a quarter in your database? Like, we don't define it. That's just obvious. And like, but, but then when you say that, they're like, oh, this is a trivial thing to do and go through. We're out of time, but reInvent's coming up. Any, any glimpse you can give us? The, well, I can guarantee it'll be exciting. Uh, how about that? There, there, it, it taps into a little bit what you guys talked about, and I'll, I'll just speak to it at a high level. Um, it is about how do we take advantage of more data? more different types of data, that's one thing. And then two, as, as you guys would know, BI is very much about doing analysis on data. Well, how do we take that to the next level? And there's efforts in both of those fronts that I think will be pretty exciting. Raising the bar at reInvent, <laughs> excited. Tracy, thanks so much for coming on the program. Awesome, I enjoyed it, thank you. All right, that wraps up our on the ground day here at AWS in Seattle, Rob Streche and Dave Vellante. Go to siliconangle.com for all the news. Thecube.net is where you'll find all these videos on demand and live. And don't forget to go to thecuberesearch.com. That's where all our deep research is. The Cube AI, ask, it's our rag. Go ask the question and you'll get an answer and you'll get some short clips. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time.